Let's go. So if you guys could tell, we are we're pretty excited because one month from now, one month and a week, uh, we'll be in Vegas for the Mint Collective. And honestly, there's no better place to be in uh, the dog days of winter than Vegas. So January 28th through 30th, Mint Collective in Vegas. You're not going to want to miss it. You're going to have a lot of people who are in the know, but you're also going to get so much access, so many cards, so many conversations. So if you're on the fence, please make sure to be there. And um, if you have any questions about tickets, pricing, if there's anything you know we can do to help you kind of push you over the fence to make sure you're there, uh, make sure you have fun, we're going to have some events there, please reach out. Reach out to Cage Lawyer. Reach out to Prism God. Reach out to myself. I am Andrew Goldberg or Lucas Tiger's Bronze Podcast. We have a really, really special guest today, uh, Mr. Prism God, and we're going to talk all things innovation in the hobby. What's up, miss, my man? What's what's going on? What's new in your world? Uh, just a lot of work, a lot of grinding, man. You know, I'm focused on culture collision, but before culture collision, I am really excited about Mint Mint Collective. I'm really excited to see what they're going to bring to the table. Um, so, you know, I think uh, it's really dope what they're putting together. I mean, shoot, unlimited budget. <laughs> Let's see what's going to happen. Can I start with an open-ended question? I'm going to pass it to, to you, Cage. When you hear the word innovation in the hobby, and this is a question for you, Yosef, but I'll go to Cage too. What does that mean to you? What does innovation in the hobby mean to you? Right. So, I mean, to innovate is, is somebody who is making a change in what we're doing, right? So an innovator, at least for this series, is somebody who's taking what we have here and moving it forward through change, you know, doing something different, doing something in, either doing something completely different or doing something that exists in a, in a way that hasn't been done before. Right. So that's why I think Prism God and, you know, when we talk about culture collision, which is his baby. That's a perfect example, I think, of, of innovation in the hobby. Right. Because I can't even tell you how many people we've had on who've talked about the national. We did a whole, you know, 10 for 10 series, people about the national. What would you think? What would you do? And everybody was saying how, you know, one of the things they'd love innovation in, one of the things they'd like to see change or an update to is a traditional show. And our guest here today may be pound for pound the most traveled <laughs> show visitor that we know we we just off camera in the 30 second lead up here talked about the different treats that you have on airlines because of where he's flying you name it to go to show and show and and the fun thing is what makes i believe him an innovator well, well we can we can ask him about all the stuff is you've been to shows i've been to shows shows get stale shows get boring shows are the same stuff with the same people with the same you know inventory and, uh, and what people have said is, you know, hey, you know what I'd love to see? I'd love to see more fun in shows. I'd love to see more action in shows. I'd love to see this area or that area in a show, a trade room in a show, or this. That the everything else in the hobby seems to be moving forward. Tech bringing it forward. Card ladder bringing, you know, the, the, the you know your comps forward. You know, content moving forward. A lot of great video content and, and stuff going out there. But the shows seem to still be in the 1980s. And boom, culture collision. Yeah. Is that about, about, is that about right, Andrew? Did I, did I do innovation proud? You got to ask my man here, Yosef. What do you think? <laughs> um, I think you, I think you kind of nailed it. Is uh, I, I didn't really like. See, it wasn't really my idea to really like say, "Hey, I'm gonna do a show." Uh, you know, honestly, it was Miss Prism Goddess. She really pushed me. She was like, "You're gonna do something. You're gonna do a show. You're gonna open up a shop." And I'm like, "Okay, well, if I'm gonna do a show, I'm gonna do it my way." That was really my whole logic going into culture collision. You know, before I um, before I got in, you don't want to go too deep unless you you know want me to. But uh, I didn't. My, my logic going into the situation is I love sneakers. You can see sneaker rack. I have more sneakers here. I have sneakers upstairs, um, and that was one of my loves because it was an inexpensive route for me to collect art or collect something that you know I felt like was really attainable at the time. Um, but I mean, I don't I didn't really see myself as an innovator, but I guess people, you know, through the course of my career and the hobby and people started paying attention. I started getting followers. I mean, I, I guess I, I never saw myself as an innovator, but I just know that I felt like there was an opportunity for change. Um, you know, and that's really what it was. I think being an innovator in a hobby is just recognizing that there's an opportunity for growth and change and things that we can become more efficient, effective. And I think it's important for us to, to fight for that. Um, I, I hear a lot of people, you know, complaining about a lot of different things. And I feel like if you're going to complain, you're not helping the, helping the situation. You should be trying to figure out a solution. 
it's like, you know, we love the hobby. Like I love the hobby. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, and all the new collectors that are in a hobby, they have a feeling you know, of loving it as well. But I think we have to protect it. So um, in order for protect it, we have to be innovative. We have to grow younger. And the the um, and I, mean, I guess the um, I don't have the words right now, but when you're dealing with sneaker culture, it's a younger culture. And it's very similar to the car culture and to the regard of we look at as a sneakerhead, I look at sneakers as art to somebody else. It's just a pair of sneakers, a pair, pair, pair of gym shoes, but it's no different than picking up a basketball card and say, oh, man, this is beautiful. I love this Jordan, you know, BGS 95. I love this PSA 10 Jordan. It's, it's beautiful to me. You know, it's hard. I have to have it. Um, and so that's where kind of kind of kind of came from for me. You know, you know where I'm seeing innovation? If I could just jump in here. And this is something I've spent I mean, the last few weeks at least watching. And this weekend I jumped in. I think there's innovation in two spaces. And it's not going to seem like innovation, but it really has changed the game. And that's all of these new shows that pop up and the decentralization of auction houses. Right? Because, I mean, it seems kind of like obvious now that i'll say it but we used to buy 90 percent of our cards on ebay <laughs> what, 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 a majority let's let's just say that way a majority yeah. now you go you have all these local shows where people go pick up their cards right every weekend you're at a show now you have alt now you have pwcc you still have heritage you have golden uh you have star stock you have all of these little fragmented marketplaces to pick up cards uh that online and then you have all these new shows popping up uh a lot of them blend culture like you do uh, i'm curious since ebay has kind of not i don't want to say fallen by the wayside but i think we could tell that on ebay there's where way less high ticket high value cards available than there were just a year ago i, I are you, agree are you still buying online are you still looking online or are most of your purchases in person are you asking me directly or are you going to? To you. You're the, yeah, you're the you. guest. All right. All right. So honestly, it's really funny that you say that. I literally went to my eBay account. No knock eBay because they're sponsored for Culture Collision. But mm -hmm. I have not purchased a card off eBay in probably six to eight months. And, I, you know, one of the reasons being is like it's a, it's ob it's a pretty obvious reason, right? Um, you can't buy a card on eBay and then turn around and sell it at a show. For what you paid for it if you're in the grind motion of trying to you know being a um a day trader so to speak um and i think that that's really where a lot of it comes from it's like you know and obviously a lot of times people hit me up through the course of the week hey man hey you interested in this so it helps when people know hey look you're obviously you're buying you're doing this uh you're moving and shaking and people would just hit me up and say hey man i think you'll do better with this than i will so hey if you want this this is my price and let me know so um that's really what it boils down to. Plus, I kind of try to wait for those weekend deals. I think I kind of leaned. I relied on that to give me, you know, to make sure, hey, I'm going to a show with the uh, motivation to try to find great deals. So, also, the bankroll doesn't hurt. You know, I mean, people know mm -hmm. you when you have those personal deals, whether it's at a show with someone you know, or you know, someone makes an intro to you online. It's all about deal flow, right? I mean, I talk about this with my, with my son when we're at the show. And, um, you know, you try to figure out a way to let the dealer see what's in the box. And then when all the dealers pass, you you stalk the guy with the box on the way out of the show and see whether or not you can make a deal. You never step on the toes. The, the dealers are paying their money for their tables. But there's a different deal flow, you know, at these shows and on eBay, right? I mean, you may see one card you like on eBay, maybe two cards, five cards, whatever it is. But they're probably all from different sellers. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if people know you're spending five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars or whatever it may be on, on a weekend because you're gonna blow that out, you know, this is your business, this is what you're doing. It's the kind of stuff you don't get on eBay, you know, over over a computer screen. Whereas, you know, if somebody knows you're out there looking to spend ten, fifteen, twenty on, on cards, you're gonna get people who come to you that have that. And maybe if they sold it on eBay and waited a couple of weeks and dealt with a consigner and paid the percentages and, and lost ten percent and you name it, they do better. But you know what? It's a lot easier to come to you and sell at 70% of comps because they'll give you what what what, what I like call a bulk discount. You know, bulk's dirty word in the hobby nowadays until PSA comes back with it. But uh, you know, that that people will people will might might be more willing to give you twenty thousand in cards that you can flip one at a time because this is what you do. 
you know, and instead of giving you the 20 at 20, maybe you get it for 14, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Because you can then flip it for 17, you know, the next week. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> can't do that on eBay. Mm-hmm. Drop the gym though for the people that are listening. You say if it's worth 20, you buy it at 14, you sell it for 17. That's right. That's the gym that people don't people miss all the time. They buy it for 14 and they want to sell it for 20. You know, <laughs> the merry-go-round would stop, right? We gotta keep this merry-go-round going round. You know what I mean? That's the we used to be able to do that with grading. Where do you so there's innovation in grading, right? I mean, in the last year, we've seen three, four different companies pop up, probably more. You're you're season. You've seen this kind of play out before, and maybe you could touch touch on uh, authenticity as it came in the sneaker space too. And if there were if something similar happened, but how should people navigate the grading landscape? Right, we want to support new companies, but at the same time, because they're so new, we don't know if they're going to be around. You know, Talk to us about that. I mean, that's that's a crazy, oh my gosh, that's a crazy good topic to discuss. And I literally had this conversation this morning. Give us um, the give us the un- unabridged version. Oh gosh, um, don't hold back. At some point in time, we have to, as collectors, we have to be open to other spaces, right? And I think that we've put a lot into PSA. Per se, I'm going to say PSA because I think the multipliers on PSA versus Beckett is ridiculous. I'm just being completely honest with you. I think that we have to be able to like there has to be an opportunity for these smaller companies. We have to give them a little bit more credit. Even myself. It's hard, though, because I usually use PSA or Beckett has been what I've relied on. But it's based upon, you know, what what has made sense through the last 20, 30 years, you know, in a hobby. Um, but now I, I think we have to, I think we have to allow for new, uh, and I challenge these new graders to bring the new, be innovative enough to, to, to show me why I should choose you over PSA and Beckett, because that's what PSA did to Beckett. And people don't realize this. Beckett was the number one grading company until PSA decided to grade, what was it? Honus Wagner, I think is what it was. Back in the day, you saw it posted on the back of a Beckett magazine, which is really funny because Beckett was the number one grader prior to then. And then you used to see it advertised. And it was like, oh, wow. Obviously, they graded that card. And then we start seeing what that card sold for as a PSA. That was value that was created there. And I think uh, uh, I think the closest company probably has caught I mean, the closest company is probably SGC. But I think that they should probably kind of figure out a way to make themselves a little bit more innovative. And and I think we should probably give these other companies a chance, but they have to come with it. I think I think they have to say, make us say, man, why wouldn't I pay them fifty bucks to grade their car? Their cases look amazing. It's protected. They're actually bringing some new technology, some new innovation that makes sense to me. And, and you know, and like right now we have CSG, we have HGA. They're going to be a culture collision. And I think we have another grading company as well that's going to be there. Uh, we do not have Beckett and PSA yet, but they're open to come. Um, but I think this culture collision space was really, that's why we call it a trade show. The space was really meant to bring in new companies, which is, I think, you know, which is one of the things we want to focus on in terms of innovation. We want innovation to be there. We want all these people to be on the platform to talk about why we should choose you instead of us just saying, you know, you know, I I guess this is like, you know, we're just, we're just used to PSA and Beckett. And I just, I, I hate that I'm used to it as well. And I have to even train myself to be open enough, but it's like retarded. Like PNWCC just had an auction yesterday where um, the 2003 um, LeBron James limited logo sold for like $400,000. And then a PSA 10 uh, 2003 autograph patch sells for like $380,000. I'm just thinking to myself, but uh, a PSA 10 is worth more than a Beckett 9.5. But it's just it's just weird how we, we, we think about these multipliers when you think about the low end stuff, how a raw card and the PSA 10 and back. It's just, it's just crazy. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk your head off, but uh, yeah, I just think that it's, it's definitely interesting. The definitely. auction that ended that was crazy to me was the Luca, the Luca oh. national treasures. That was, I, I'm, I'm curious who's the buyer on that. And I'd love to have them on the show. Is it you cage? It was Luca's mom. It was Luca's mom. <laughs> She's buying her own autographs back. I mean, she, she's sweeping the floor. It's smart. <laughs> Luca might be buying his own stuff. Why not? Everybody else is, except Giannis. He's buying Bobby Portis. 
I definitely think I definitely think Giannis. Uh, well, definitely it could be Luca. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if more athletes get into the hobby and reinvest and buy their own stuff anyway. I mean, they make millions of dollars anyway, and if they know what they're capable of and what can happen in the future, I mean, I, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, I heard Zion is actually selling his own cards. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. He'll be buying them back once he trades the picks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that's, it's probably true. That's probably very, very true. Listen, I mean, listen, the grading stuff, it's an interesting topic. It really is. And, you know, we talk about innovator. Talk about a space where there was, you know, innovation this year. And yet with that innovation comes so much pushback. Right. You know, you have these people who are trying something new. Right. You have these people who are coming in trying to fill a void, even when the big dogs are closed. Like even when, you know, it's, it's almost like, all right, you know, uh, Coke and Pepsi shut down. You know, let's get these these, you know, these small craft soda companies come out of the woodwork. But, you know, the people are so loyal to the brand or so used to, you know, what they've had. It's like, you know what? No. I'm going to pay extra for that, you know, the, the, the one I know, and I'm going to really push back against the innovation, the AI grading or whatever these other companies are bringing, custom labels and whatnot. Do you see any of that in your, in your own, you know, way of doing business? I consider you an innovator, man, because a couple of things. Number one, you have to roll with the punches in how you uh, navigate the hobby waters, right? So it was easier for me a couple of years ago. It was, you know, buy raw, grade, flip. And buy better cards. I mean, you're now basically jet setting across the country, you know, it, every different show to try to, you know, you know, uh, arbitrage one card off another, buy here and sell there, take advantage of the fact that what people know and see in one location they don't have access to in an other location. You know, you buy in New York and sell in Atlanta, buy in Denver and then sell in California. You know, you, you are bringing cards around that will be fresh inventory for a show that might not be, you know, that might all, besides your stuff you're bringing, might actually have dead, dead inventory, a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Yeah. You combine that with the fact that, um, you know, you're now building the show in February, you know, the Culture Collision show, which is unlike anything, because you're bringing in comics, you're bringing in cards, you're bringing in collectibles. You are the epitome of an or. I mean, of an end instead of or. And this hobby is always or. This hobby has been, this is the way it's done. Stop trying to mess with that. Do you get any of that? You get any pushback? You get any people who run traditional shows who are like, why are you doing it this way? This is the way it should be. You get any people at, at card shows who are like, what the hell are you doing here? You know, this is our kind of show. And, you yeah. know, you're, 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 you know, we don't like this. Because believe it or not, what's funny is that's how everything starts. That's how PSA starts. Like I could tell you guys listening out there now, and I've said this a couple times on our show, I remember going to card shows where 90% of the people at the show said PSA was stupid and that they would never use PSA and that nobody should need to pay someone to tell them what their card grade was or to put their card in a slab. It's cardboard. I should be able to touch it. I should be able to see it. I should be able to put it under my pillow at night and sleep with it by Eddie Stanky or whoever they were, you know, collecting at the time, right? But but now that has changed. That is innovation. So talk to me about that, man, because I think you're you're switching up the way that things are traditionally done. Get a lot of pushback? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, the first show, I had a lot of pushback. I definitely had a lot of pushback. Um, I, of course, we had a lot of people that did not show up. I mean, for the backstory on Culture Collision, I mean, we announced our show. Dallas announced their show out shortly after we announced our show. So I got pushback from, you know, from that, of course, uh, I've heard stories cause I've never got, I've never done a show before, but I've heard stories of people competing, doing shows against each other on purpose and stuff like that. And to me, that's the dumbest thing you can do. We should be working together. It's, it, this space is big enough for everybody. We're talking about a 50, 50 plus States of being able to put a show up. And we're talking about, we're over, 5,000 miles away from each other. I'm not your competition. Trust right. me. <laughs> you have enough in your market to be able to be successful. So, I mean, that was never something I would intentionally wanted to do, but at the same time, I, I did want to stand my ground. I wanted to be able to push to say, Hey, look guys, I think we're very, you know, Hey, you can be the best you can be and I'm going to be the best I can be. And we both can be successful within our space. And that's how I wanted to do it in a respectful manner. Um, and also received pushback from people in the beginning because, but but I did this on purpose though. Uh, people were like, well, what type of show is it? I said, well, what do you know me for? I do right. cards. <laughs> you don't know any other aspect of me. 
I, I mean, for the people that know me on a personal level, they would know I'm in the sneakers. They know I'm in the comics and they know I'm in the pops. I'm know, you know, you know, the other aspects of me, but I love a little bit of everything. I mean, I think that I have got to the point to where I can appreciate art for whatever it is. And I see the beauty in a lot of different things. So for me, you know, that's where I'm at. But I did receive a lot of pushback because people were like, well, is it a Pokemon show? Is it, you know, because the first flyer that I did literally had Pikachu on it, Spider-Man on it. But honestly, I was wanting to appeal to the, the people that weren't collectors because right. I feel like getting card people to buy into Culture Collision was the easy part. It's getting the comic book people and the sneaker people because here's the thing, right? You guys are going to continue to go to sports card shows all forever. But the thing is, though, how can we bring in new people into the hobby? Because that's how we're going to continue to thrive. We have to bring in new people, educate them, and then say, hey, look, you know, that's art, but this is art, too. You know, and this is how I feel, you know, and, and and we talk about it in a respectful manner. And then maybe we create new collectors, you know, maybe we, you know, create new investors. Maybe we get maybe we get those new innovators that can say, I see your point. I'm going to do a show just like you did a show and I'm going to do something better or, you know, or I'm going to do a comic book show and I'm going to add cards or do something, you know, whatever they decide they want to do. But I received a lot of pushback in the beginning and a lot of people did not show up to Culture Collision because they didn't know what it was. But the amazing part about it to me that really meant a lot to me was the fact that my sponsors, they believed in me enough to be able to say, man, I know I believe in what you're doing. And the people that did show up to the show, they believed in what I was doing and they trust the process. And I mean, I'm very appreciative of the fact that people took a chance on, on Culture Collision and then bought into the idea. And then now I'm just, you know, I'm trying to recreate it and make it better. You know, we go back to the drawing board, we make it better. That's what an innovator does. It's a circle. It's three steps. You put the right the idea out. You you test it. Then you put it out there. Then you say, okay, well, what type of flaws do I have? Then you start over and you do it again. And I, I try to, I think I want to try to recreate that every single time. So even now, this time we started out with, you get to choose your own, own, own tables, which I thought was a great idea. Uh, from the guy in Las Vegas, uh, the Las Vegas show. He actually was the first person I saw do that. And I thought to myself, like, that's a great idea because, for one, it builds a sense of urgency. Then it takes away okay. what I have to go through. And this is not and this is not my innovation, but I think that the idea of culture collision maybe birthed other ideas for other people and created more innovators in this space to where we're all like, okay, we all know that, okay, um, you know, uh, the Nationals makes, you know, X amount of money. And what do they kind of bring to the situation? What makes what makes the national so great? It's the people. But I think that that has to change where I think we have to add more value as a promoter. And if I'm making X amount of money, I can put money into it to make it better and say, hey, look, guys, I'm going to do this for you guys. I feel like we have to pay it forward through all aspects. So if you're going to support me. I'm going to support you and make sure that you enjoy yourself while you're coming out. So that's my response. You have a four on four basketball tournament, right? Hundred percent. How'd you set that up? What was the, what was the idea behind that? Uh, well, at the time, uh, I think it came from a lot of people saying I would go to shows and people say, "Hey, man, you want to go play basketball?" And I'm like, I heard this too many times. I think you should do a basketball game like at the show. It'd be kind of cool. Let's do something. So, uh, the nail in the coffin is I went to California. I played Sasha and Nady, uh, my boy Mike. Uh, we played a three on three. I'm sorry, Mojo Sports. Uh, he was out there, so we all played in California at a Mark's Cards event. Uh, he had a show outside, so we played basketball outside. And I was like to myself, like, man, we should do this. I think I'm gonna add this to culture collision. <laughs> who, who, who's ga- who had who had game that you wouldn't expect? Uh, I think Sasha was a was a. He surprised me a little bit. He might have got lucky, which is why I need to see what he's gonna do in a culture collision. So I would say, I would yeah. say he surprised me a little bit, but I know you gotta, you gotta, you, you have a vendetta, right? You got, you gonna play him at culture collision? Is that what's going on? <laughs> Depends on the day. I got a vendetta against everybody. It's, it's weird. <laughs> well, I, I don't even know what's going on in my head sometimes. It's uh, <laughs> we we have a friendly bet, but we need to amend that bet because we bet uh, Luca Prism PSA ten. Well, it can happen at Culture Collision, and I can make sure that that happens a one-on-one for this. We can play for slabs, for slabs. and I'll, let, I'll start off with you guys to get Let's you go. guys started, and uh, and I think we can make that happen. I, I know for a fact I can make that happen. All right, well, we can only do this on one <laughs> condition. What's I condition? get to tie up like a bandana around my head, and I get to play birdie. 
I'm Birdie on the side, right? I gotta call. I gotta call Andrew. He's gonna be Kyle Watson. Okay. And he's so much above the rim, man. Dude, how do you know? Above, above the rim, the rim. Birdie, man. <laughs> you know, Birdie. No, you're I was actually going. To, actually, the birdie. jerseys. The, I was thinking about making the jerseys like uh, above the rim jerseys. The, rim, the <laughs> black jersey. Yeah, Mota. Right. Yeah, but no, nah, I had to go to something different. It'll be something real special, man. I think. And then, but next year, I, I, I've even learned from my first time doing this show. It's like I probably won't be doing a four on four next season. Next time, it'll just be a twelve man roster, four quarters, like a real regular game, and it'll be influencers and people who actually in hobby. We're doing a charity game every year, so it'll be a charity game once a year, every year going forward. Uh, but four on four is going to still be real special for the first for the first time around, um, and give everybody the opportunity to be a part of the first. You know, inaugural charity game. We're gonna have an MVP. We're gonna have a trophy. Everybody's gonna have special jerseys. So it's gonna be really dope. That's all I can say. Listen, we gotta help you. If it's a charity event, we gotta help you make the teams. Because I envision oh. like one team with like Rob Petroza on one side, Ezra Levine on the other. Okay. Right? Maybe, maybe like Nat Turner on one side. Maybe Woo. like Doctor Beckett on the other. I like that. Uh, you know, Ken Golden on one side, and Ooh. like uh, uh, Brett Huggins. From PWCC on the other, like you, you know, you gotta set it up like the rivalry game. You yeah, know? like you know, the, I like the, that. Be well, good. you know what? I think next next year, I think I'm gonna aim for that. I'm gonna get we can get Gary V too. We can get Gary V. Actually, you know, I like to get Vegas Dave too. I'm sure people. Oh, love Oh, there we go. That was, that's it. There's the point guards for each team. You got Vegas Dave on one side, Gary on the other. I'm gonna see if he's gonna bet on himself. <laughs> Last question. I want to ask you about the market because here's what I've seen in the market. I've seen. High high ticket items, six figure cards and above. I, they're sending record prices, or they're right near record prices. But I've seen high pop, um, less than a thousand, less than four figure cards, depreciate in value and get killed. So you kind of see this like kind of this separation in the middle. You know, the high ticket items are setting records. Low ticket items, you know, retail investors are like, well, what should I do? What advice, suggestions, or you know? projection and maybe is a better word do you have for 2022 i think that we will see um i think we will see and you can tell by last yesterday's auction at pwcc and i use this as an example the 2018 tom brady psa 10 just did a record yes. for me for like twenty one thousand yeah, dollars silver just a regular silver unknown prism silver and that was so mind-blowing for me it told me one of two things that silver market's going to eventually it's going to change eventually um, we'll just have to see how long it's going to take, but I think that we're going to see a lot of appreciation. Basketball hasn't really hit its prime yet. I think we've seen the only thing we've actually seen this year happen was Steph Curry broke the record, and look what his cards are doing. I mean, if we see LeBron James break, you know, beat, you know, beat all-time scoring at number two, you know, passing Carl Malone, then maybe we see maybe a love for him. Maybe we see some playoff runs happening. But I mean, we're talking about early next year, and people don't realize that you, right now we're in December. It's a down market. Next year, we're going to see Super Bowl. Next year, early next year, we're going to Super Bowl, all-star break, going into the finals, and then World Cup, potentially. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I definitely think that we're going to see an uptick on a lot of different cards. Can't say all cards, but I think that, you know, if people are playing well, I think that their cards are going to eventually appreciate. I mean, I love to so see Trey Young get a lot of love. My PSA 9 Rui Hachimura stack, I should not, like, I shouldn't be hanging on to that whole thing. <sighs> Man, I'm be honest with you. I, I think you should have sold it last year, but <laughs> but but this is my two cents. My two cents. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, Rui Hachimura could be the next Giannis. I just don't see it likely. <laughs> Even if he is PSA nine, so nobody wants him. Oh uh, no, a hundred percent. I mean, it's. I mean, the market. I, I don't think that's maybe maybe the cure that the grading companies are kind of looking at. Like, all right, we're gonna grade less of these million cards and we'll focus more on the cards that people really care about. Right. And it's the low numbered stuff. It's the numbered stuff. I mean, that's the stuff that, that doesn't change as drastically as your base cards and your silver cards. So I think this, you know, I think we just keep our open mind, our, our minds open. I know myself, I try to only focus on low numbered stuff. That's usually where I focus on. I mean, or stuff that I feel like is really easy to move. I mean, look what Pat, Patrick Mahomes silvers are back up. Seven game one. What I heard was, and I kind of agree with it, it was a market reset, right? We're always looking for equilibrium. I, I feel like it was a market reset. I hope we don't lose market participants with the reset. 
Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's definitely one of the concerns that I think we have, but I think it's a responsibility of us. And unfortunately, it's a responsibility of these card shops. And the card shops don't really take a lot of ownership in what they do, but it comes from the customer service. It comes from being able to have these conversations. It comes from um, being mentors to collectors and, you know, let, you know, making, you know, honestly, if you're new to the hobby, I'd probably tell you, you know, if you come in my door and I have, if I had a shop, you come into my door, yeah, I want you to spend money. I don't want you to be happy spending money. I want you to be able to say, you know, I'll tell you straight up, hey, look, we do breaks. You know, if you want to get into it an inexpensive route, this is maybe an inexpensive way to go about it. Um, and, and also, you even see Panini doing it, too. Panini's actually, I'll say this, Panini's done a good job of putting out inexpensive products for people who really want to break. Because you've seen Flux cost 300 bucks. Chronicles is 300 bucks. But then you still have the marquee products that are still $1,000, which is Prism, $1,500. Then your national treasure is like four or five thousand dollars, but they put out product that people can afford as well. So I, I'll say shout out to Panini, and I guess that made that may be kind of a innovative way of doing it because they're putting out new products that people are kind of like not really unsure about, but it's, it's giving them an opportunity to fulfill that need of the what if, and then also you, you get to pull your favorite rookie card or whatever. So I think uh, I think you know I think that's a great great thing too. So. Chronicles is good for, you know, I, I try to break something every Friday with my son. And Chronicles mm -hmm. is not killer. You know, the hybrid boxes and stuff like that, I can still get them. The only problem is, you know, I'm able to get those boxes. I mean, I guess I got to plan ahead, but I'm able to get those boxes because I go to my local guy and he's getting an allocation. I actually found another store. Um, I dropped my daughter off ice skating yesterday and found another store a couple, a couple miles away further than I normally travel. But, hey, why not? And he was complaining to me about the same thing. And these are guys, look, they're not going to complain unless you ask, because obviously I'm a prober, you know, I'm like an alien. Hide your butt. <laughs> so here's the thing, right? You know, you know, so, so, so this is one of those things, right? And everybody, if you ask, they'll tell you the same thing, allocations. And when I say to them, I'm like, well, where's your allocation going? They both say the same thing, breakers. They said breakers. He says, you know, the one guy yesterday told me, he said he heard of a breaker local here went to a distributor and said, I'm going to give you a quarter of a million dollars. Just going to hand you a quarter of a million dollars and we'll draw it down. Make sure you give me the allocation. Make sure, you know, I don't care where you're getting it from. Take it from the LCS if you have to. But once we get down to 50, I'll just bump it back up to 250 again. And you guys can just keep the money like a rolling, you know, door credit revolving, wow. you name it, the whole deal. And he's like, and, and, you know, he said, see this product here? I used to get a case of this. Now I get a box. See this product here? I used to get two cases. Now I get three boxes. Yeah. And, you know, the tough part for me is even, you know, Chronicles or Flux or any of these small things, like I have to basically reserve it with my guy and be like, all right, if you get one box, I want it. And I know <laughs> next week you're only going to get one and you've got to give that to somebody else who's a longtime customer. That's fine. We'll figure it out. I'm not going to be greedy. Um, so I, I guess, you know, the breaking, it's an interesting thing to talk about. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about that, but it, it's definitely something on my mind because... You know, you, you hit the nail right on the head. When you got somebody coming in and spending money in your store, yeah, you want them to spend money, but you want them to be happy. You want them to spend their money and leave happy, right? Because a happy customer is going to be a repeat customer. Or a customer who feels like he was taken advantage of or she left without value is probably not coming back, right? Yep. Are breaking customers always going to come back because they're a different breed? They're a gambler. They're looking for that online hit. Is it a slot machine type of thing that they're able to get through cards? Because to me, about 80% of the people who break are losers. Not losers because you're not cool. Losers because you're not going to get back what you're putting in on those breaks. Especially now, when it used to be you broke a box, you could bulk grade, you could value sub it, and you could get some of that back in six or eight months. Now you can't even do that. So is breaking now a dangerous thing, especially with all these people putting that much money into it and that many people doing it? Is breaking you know, going to lose those customers? Those, is, is breaking really the way we want the first-time customers to come in? Because chances are they're going to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a, a tough space to be in, especially as a new collector. You're trying to figure out where you should go about Because, I mean, because like I said, retail is kind of – Meh at best, you know. So, um, I mean, any of the good products not there, and you're gonna pay basically almost what you pay at a hobby shop, and you're you know you're not giving yourself the best opportunity to pull the best cards. Uh, but it's still a gateway if you can if you can attain if you can get it. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're right. 
Uh, for myself, uh, for the first time ever, I broke aggressively on National Treasures because I was aggressively going after LaMelo Ball and mm-hmm. Anthony Edwards. Um, and James Wiseman was the other guy I was going after aggressively. So to be able to get into those breaks and shoot, when I say I didn't do, I didn't get anything, you're right. I didn't get anything. I probably wasted like two grand uh, through the course of like maybe like a case and a half, which, you know, wasn't ultimately wasn't that bad because if I would have bought a box for $4,000 and I, you know, I don't get anything, I'm probably just as mad as <laughs> you get $200 for the cards back. Um, so I guess it's, you know, it's a tough space to be in, but I mean, I think it's still an inexpensive way to get get one of the best cards or premier cards if you're getting into breaks. Right. Gambling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't want to, I don't want to use the term gamble because, I mean, I, I don't want to use the term gambling, but I'm just going to say it's giving you the best opportunity. Yeah, at a price point. I, I get it. I, I mean, point. I don't want to crap on breaking. It doesn't. It allows people to get into a product that they otherwise would not get into because I could spend $4,000 to get a box yep. of National Treasure, so you can get in and have a chance. Mm-hmm. Right, so I get it. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm sorry. I, I got one last question because we try to keep these 30 minutes or so. Uh, sneaker culture that's where you come from, right? You have Jordans on your wall. Yes, do they have do they love the, the Jordan Nike promo card? Do they know about that card? No, most sneaker heads are not card collectors, most of them not. Now, the funny part about that is most card collectors can appreciate sneakers because if you go to a show, you will see a handful of people have random rare sneakers on. Yep. It's like, well, where'd you get those? Oh, I like sneakers. You didn't expect me to have these on? Like, I think I met this older guy uh, at the Dallas show. He had on a pair of Travis Scott sixes. And I was just like, what are you doing with those on? He's like, yeah, I like them. So I bought them. Great. I mean, so- you can appreciate sneakers. <laughs> So sneaker culture doesn't cross to cards yet. Culture collision might help with that. Uh, Mint Collective might help with that. But card people do respect shoes, do respect sneakers. Yeah, I would say I would say it's definitely. I think we. Can, I think as card collectors, we can respect sneakers more so than sneaker people because I think it's for it's foreign, it's foreign to sneaker collectors to say, ah, this card. It's oh man, I like this card. You know, it's, it's foreign versus you know, or, or they might say I like the player. Of course, they obviously know with today's news that it's obviously worth money. Right. Um, I think that's where I think people have kind of gravitated towards the card market before people really knew the value of cards was like substantial. It's like oh man, that that attracts people, right? We see Golden talk about on TV. Oh man, we just broke a record, two million dollars. Okay, and they're doing it on a weekly basis, if not a, a daily basis new records and then now people's like oh man like i think i'm gonna try cards out but there's no education between the two there's no conversation like the the card market has always been a tight-knit circle in my opinion when i first got into the industry i had a handful of people that actually knew me that would talk to me about how to become you know how how to actually become good at this business right um and and when i mean shout out to jeremy and terry rest in peace terry terry doolin um those are some of the guys that I saw that would travel from show to shows and would, would get to it. You know, they would, you know, I saw these guys aggressive. Um, those are kind of like the first group of guys that I actually really saw that would go show to show. And I just, I just used to travel with them. And now I kind of travel further out than they do. But, you know, that's that's kind of where it is. I think the sneaker market, and that's why I feel like Culture Collision, it has to be a situation where we invite sneakerheads to the show so we can create new collectors and new investors. We can have conversations with them because I think that the reality is I think that that sneaker that car collectors would appreciate sneakers faster than, than sneaker people can appreciate cards. But I think that we can have a conversation about it because I've, I've invited one of my friends who came from the sneaker culture to the card culture and even somebody like Roth cards, they came from the sneaker culture to the card culture. They understand it now. And it's like, Oh yeah, I get it. This makes sense to me. And I don't see how, why I would go back to the sneaker culture unless I'm just buying some sneakers that I really want. You know what you need to do? You need to find somebody who's got a kick-ass collection of the sneaker spotlights from noir cards. Oh, that's you easy. Gotta introduce those over. You need a gateway. Right. You know, Andrew did not start on LSD and crack cocaine. He started with weed. You need that gateway drug. Right. So some of these sneaker guys, they're going to be. This is client work. They were were doing. Well, I think a lot of the sneaker guys, I know a few of them who transitioned from it locally 
Um, uh, my, my guy, nice. He, he switched. He came from the singer culture, but he was buying retail, and he doesn't yeah. understand. He doesn't understand. Like I've, I've I've had conversation with people like, hey, stop ripping those boxes. If you're gonna make it, if you just want to focus on making money, sell the boxes. You're gambling, just ripping the boxes. Just sell the money, make the margin, then start buying and investing into cards. Because chances are, like, uh, what do you always say? Sometimes money can, you know, you can make money work harder than you can. Yep. And if you're buying the right cards, literally, I bought a card one week and the next weekend, it's doubled in value. It just happens that quickly. And sneakers, it doesn't happen that quickly. But if the minute that somebody catches whiff of that in the sneaker world, it's like, oh, wow, it's that easy? It's that simple? I don't have to do much of anything? And if you're buying the right cards, they sell themselves. Less supply. Less supply, right? In sneaker okay. world? Well, no. I think in a sneaker world, in my, my, my mind, I think Nike has figured out a good <laughs> – Nike's figured out a really good uh, solution. They just put quick strike on everything and everything sells. <laughs> Quick strike means basically it's very limited, but that very limited, they don't have a number. It's not like every shoe. Right, is that's the number. difference. So I don't know how many. SSP. So you don't know how many. So as long as you put quick strike on it, and then like if you ever go to the sneaker app, every every Nike product is literally has a it's it's literally a, what do they call it? It's a raffle. So you have to be raffled into a sneaker. So it therefore makes you feel like you're special. But then when you try to sell it, and you're like, oh, I sold it for 50 bucks. It's like, I went through all that to make 50 bucks. Right. I had to go through a lottery system to get into this. Exactly. To 50 bucks. Yeah, it's a very, it's a very different world. Um, but to respect of, like, what's crazy is, is for generations, we have trained ourselves in the sneaker world to get up early in the morning and go get in line and go get a pair of sneakers. But in the card world, this was foreign to us. But now when you, like, you've probably heard people getting murdered. I think somebody got murdered yeah, at Target, Target last, yeah. Year, yeah. last year. But now it's gotten to the point where the cultures have kind of collided a little bit. And now, therefore, a lot of things that have happened in the sneaker world are just now happening in a card world because people are seeing that there's value there. Wait, so the and culture is, there's a collision? <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a collision. Does it, I got it. I like it. <laughs> Love you guys. Like my own words. <laughs> hey, take us home. We're, we're a month and a week away. Take us home here. Listen, oh, I, listen I can't wait to hang out. I, I can't wait to see Sasha T dunk on Andrew's head. I mean, I didn't say that out loud. Um, you know, I, it's a cool thing. I will tell you, you know, um, I love some of the innovation in the space here, whether it's, you know, bringing the card show itself into the future, trying to, you know, make sure I'm out here complaining all the time about how we're losing people in the hobby because of grading, because of retail, you name it. I think the real innovation that you're doing is trying to backfill that with other people. You shouldn't get crap for putting Pikachu on your poster because what you're trying to do is bring in somebody who might be a gamer or a comic person or somebody who plays Pokemon but doesn't collect the cards. You're trying to bring them into the space. You know, you're trying to bring the sneaker sneakerheads into the space, right? Because there's look, we're all collectors at heart, right? A collector is a collector, and there's something that ties that, right? So, you know, if if, if you're turned off or, or, or 10% of the hobby leaves and I'm like, oh, wow, we're going to lose some of the hobby market participants, well, your innovation is well, let's welcome some more people in. Let's welcome some people who might not know about the cards and how similar it is and how that there is a culture of collision between comics, artwork, sneakers, you name it. And it's a real cool thing that you're doing. I'm happy to have a chance to chat with you. I can't wait to hang out with you at the Mint Collective. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You're 100% right, man. It's just, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. I think that culture collision wants to be the gateway. We want to become the gateway. And, 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 and I guess in essence, we are the gateway. We want to be from A to Z collectors. We want everyone to be able to come into the space and be able to say, I want to learn about Magic the Gathering. I want to learn about why are these sneakers $5,000? Do you like why is that? So these are conversations that need to be had. Well, these are the first pair of Yeezys that ever came out. Do you know who Yeezy is? It's probably it's, it's one of the most popular person of all time at this, you know, almost as big as Michael wow. Jackson. Why do the last Yeezy design look like Crocs? <laughs> They're comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Don't wear my sandals. But if, yeah, you ever go a puddle, if you ever go through a puddle, your feet are gonna be drenched. I can't, you know what I'm excited for? I'm going to trade a slab for a pair of sneakers at Culture hey, Club. I'm totally for it. I literally told I literally have told some people who are setting up with sneakers that I'm going to spend money and buy sneakers, and I challenge you to go buy some cards. 
I'm gonna Let's buy go. sneakers and I challenge you to go buy some cards. Buy some cards, and I wanna I really honestly I would love to be able to trade a slab. You know what? I'll trade you this for a pair of Yeezys. I, I don't want to pay six thousand right now, but I give you this card. <laughs> it's worth six thousand. <laughs> but I mean, I'll probably do it. I mean, I just think that it, it's, it's so dope to be able to create a bigger space and uh with the power of eBay and everybody else that, that see the vision and you guys see the vision. I, I love to see it come together and we just continue to make this thing better. So I'm, I'm thankful. Appreciate you, Prism God and Prism Goddess. We'll hey, there you go.